Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back uh, to our session on training local forces, applying lessons learned from Afghanistan to Iraq. My name is Hans Rau, and I have the pleasure of facilitating this session with uh, four great speakers uh, that we have online and in person here, you, sitting man. right next to me. Um, thank you for your active uh, participation. Uh, thank you for the questions, uh, sending these in on time so we can actually relate them to our speakers. Uh, and let me just briefly go to a few housekeeping uh, notes. Um, most of you have heard about these, so I'll just run through them. Um, all sessions will be recorded. Uh, please actively engage with the speakers and audience. Uh, please do take advantage of the networking opportunities. You can go to our meet and greet, uh, ask questions to uh, previous speakers, current speakers, and, and other people online on the platform. Uh, please do find additional content in the uh, resource uh, library section of our uh, page. <coughs> And please make sure to contact the organizers if there's any questions or comments on the proceedings or if there's any uh, technical challenges in getting uh, onto our platform. Um, with that, um, I would like to introduce all four of our panelists. Really, the idea is that we have a, a conversation, an exchange here. Um, so rather than me doing lengthy introductions for each uh, for each section, I would like to introduce all four in, in one fell swoop. So we would like to start off uh, by uh, introducing to you Steve Driehaus. Steve is resident senior director in Iraq for the National Democratic Institute. The focus on NDI's work in Iraq centers on strengthening political parties, professionalizing the offices and staff of members of parliament, empowering women and youth to engage in the political process, and monitoring to ensure fair and impartial elections. We will then have uh, Dr. Julia Steeds. She is director of the Global Public Policy Institute, or GPPI, a non-profit think tank based in Berlin. She currently is principal investigator of the research project uh, Protecting Civilians from Harm, How Armed Actors Can Be Made to Comply with Rules. Then thirdly, um, here in the studio, we have Mr. Hassan or Dr. Hassan Jawad Kadim. Um, he is a political advisor and analyst of politics of the Middle East. He was the former political advisor to the Minister of Interior and is currently the foreign uh, relations advisor to the National Security Advisor and the official focal point between the North Atlantic Treaty uh, Organization or NATO and the Office of the National Security Advisor or Onsa. Uh, and then last but certainly not least, we have Mike, uh, uh, Mike Jason, uh, retired Colonel Mike Jason, uh, who is the executive director of Allied Airlift 21, uh, a uh, 501 pending nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting the evacuation of American citizens and Afghan allies. Mike is a national security professional and a retired U.S. Army colonel with over 24 years of active military service. And let me add to that that Mike Jason has served in every Army leadership position from leading a tank platoon to commanding a 1,000-soldier sh uh, special operations task force. So uh, let me just state that we are incredibly happy with these four uh, distinguished panelists. Um, again, the topic is uh, applying lessons learned from uh, Iraq, uh, from Afghanistan to Iraq. And let me uh, start off by saying that we will not do a, a comparative analysis between uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. Rather, we hope to draw out a few lessons that we've heard about uh, earlier uh, today in previous sessions and see what we may be able to learn and apply in the case of Iraq. And since we have four rather diverse speakers, we hope to really bring you uh, uh, four different perspectives, exchange between those perspectives uh, and include all the questions that you may have from the audience live here or online. With all of that said, Steve, may I hand over the floor to you uh, for uh, your statement or your initial uh, statement at least. Thank you. Uh, sure, Hans, and thank you very much. And, and thanks uh, to Pax for hosting this conference. Um, 
Uh, I've been asked to give some perspective as, as the country director for NDI uh, here in Iraq. Uh, I'm coming to you from Erbil, Iraq, and, and I'm glad Dr. Hassan is there uh, in the studio to correct me uh, when I go astray uh, in my analysis of Iraq. Um, but what I'd like to do is just kind of paint the picture for you of what we see at NDI and, and what I, I've observed uh, working both with government as well as civil society. And what we've seen uh, here in Iraq is that people are tired. Uh, people are tired of government that doesn't deliver, that doesn't deliver services. Uh, people are tired of the militarization of their society. And uh, they're tired of you know, the, the oppression of, of COVID as well as the uh, additional burden of uh, global warming that's impacting many parts of Iraq. And so uh, people are tired and, and they're looking toward a future that could be brighter than what they've seen in their past. And, and they're looking for solutions and they're looking for people that will deliver on those solutions. Um, along those lines, we recently had elections here in Iraq. And, and that's incredibly important because these are the fifth parliamentary elections uh, since 2004. And, and these elections took place on October 10th and they're just now being finalized because there've been several challenges uh, to the elections. And we're just getting to a point where we can finalize the elections and the results. But the elections are critically important because I think it, it presents an opportunity, a real turning point for the people of Iraq and when it comes to the future. And, and the reason I say that is because unlike previous elections that have been parliamentary list systems where they formed uh, consensus governments where everyone got a piece of the pie and there was a tremendous amount of corruption. It's very likely that this new system, which is based upon 83 districts uh, where people are elected, will result in a majority government, a majority government with a minority, a very outspoken minority, uh, taking on that majority government. And, and the reason this is important is that because traditionally in the parliamentary systems here, what we've seen is that members of parliament are beholden to their parties. Now with these 83 districts, it's far more likely that members of parliament are going to be responsible to the constituents in their communities. So you have on average four MPs who are elected in, in each one of these constituencies, in each one of these districts. And so their focus is going to be on constituent services. Their focus is, is going to be on holding government accountable and, and learning their roles as, as legislators, uh, unlike uh, the, the legislators that have necessarily been there in the past. And so we see this as a, as a distinct change. On top of that, the election saw a record number of women getting elected. And so women are, are stepping up to the fore. They're getting involved in society. And we're certainly seeing that um, in some of the provinces just south of Kurdistan. So if you look at the provinces that had been previously occupied by ISIS, for example, um, where women were oppressed, but at the same time came out of that oppression stronger than ever. And we've heard this time and time again, working with women's groups in those provinces that the, the control of ISIS, as terrible as it was, it made them stronger. And so what we're seeing is that more and more women are coming to the forefront when it comes to civil society. And so you have 95 women who were elected uh, in this past election. It was 97. We think two of those seats are going to shift, so it's going to be 95. But that's out, of a, that's out of a parliament of 329 members. So it's a very, very significant number, those 95. In addition to that, you had 15 Tijrini members elected. The Tijrinis were the protesters in 2019 that brought about the early election, that brought about the downfall of the previous prime minister and the replacement of the prime minister. And they're the reasons these elections occurred in October. So that's a very, very important figure, these 19 uh, Tijrinis being elected. And then on top of that, 40 independents. Those 40 independents have now turned into about 20 as people have been peeled off to political parties. But still, you have what is a significant movement calling for change. And here in Kurdistan, you have new generation coming up with nine seats uh, for the first time, which is a very important movement in Kurdistan. So we're seeing a change in political dynamics. We're seeing uh, a population who wants to take control of its future, who is tired of corruption, who are tired of militarization, and want to see delivery of services. 
And so not only have you seen this in the electoral process, but you're seeing this in protests that are taking place all across Iraq when it comes to delivery of electricity, delivery of water, um, student fees, et cetera. You're seeing people stand up and, and demand their rights. And so with that, I'll leave it to the rest of my colleagues and, and I'll come back and uh, answer questions to the best I can. Great. Thank you very much, Steve, for uh, uh, introducing kind of in, in a way the context and a few of the the, the recent uh, changes. Maybe before um, going to uh, Julia, there's one uh, question from the audience that I would like to uh, to ask you. Um, uh, the question is, can women safely participate in the political process in Iraq or do they actually fear reprisal? If you could briefly kind of comment on that, Steve. Thank you. Well, look, we had we had probably the most efficient elections that we've had of those five parliamentary elections, and that was due to changes at IHEC, which is the Elections Commission, as well as a lot of international oversight of those elections. However, however, uh, candidates do often run into harassment. Uh, we have candidates who are assassinated uh, during this process. We, we had 50 acts of violence, which we documented. Uh, so certainly women have uh, challenges running for office. We had many women uh, that we trained um, who were threatened while they were running for office. We had many women who we were working with who decided not to run because they didn't want to go through the process of harassment. It remains a very significant issue in Iraq. It's a very real challenge for women. It's a, it's a challenge for anyone to want, run, quite frankly, but it's, it's far tougher for women. And so the women uh, that have stepped up and run and won are very strong. And, and we look forward to working with them in Parliament in, in a much stronger capacity. Great. Thank you very much, Steve, for uh, responding to that one. Um, Dr. Steeds, may I hand over to you uh, for an opening statement? Thank you. Thanks very much, Hans, and thanks also, Steve, for setting the scene so well. Um, that's exactly where I wanted to start as well, is to say... As we think about what kinds of lessons from Afghanistan can we apply to Iraq, it's very useful to think about what's special about Iraq so that we also know where are the limitations to lessons from elsewhere that we can apply. And in our research, we found really that there were three areas that, that are quite striking, that, that are special and that pose special challenges to questions of how do you train local forces so that they uh, do less harm to civilians and protect civilians better. Let me go through those three. The first one is really about the nature of armed actors. Now, in, in Iraq, you have such a diversity of armed actors. You've got the classic army, police, intelligence, and community police, and that both from the federal side um, and from the Kurdish side. Then, of course, you have the classic terrorist organization, ISIS, which you know, even though much, much, much diminished is, is still around. But then you also have all those different groups that are summarized under the name of popular mobilization forces. So these include tribal militias, militias linked to different religious groups, uh, militias linked to specific political and, and religious figures that were all given a, a kind of special status um, during the fight against ISIS and are now somewhere in between state forces and non-state forces have this hybrid nature, which really is quite particular to Iraq. So one thing that this implies, if you want to train local forces, is really that you need to decide who should be trained. Um, do you focus on those groups that are most problematic? that commit the most violations? Or do you focus your training on those groups um, where really you want to build the legitimacy and that you see long-term um, as the security forces of, of Iraq? And accordingly, you see different actors taking different stances on, on this. Um, I haven't met anybody who seriously wants to engage with ISIS and train them, um, particularly now. Um, pretty much everybody is quite happy to engage with the federal forces and, and, and police, and particularly the community police. There's also quite a few actors, including the Western militaries, that engage with the Kurdish first forces, which is already seen skeptically by some uh, 
because there is, of course, a, a, a power issue between the federal forces and, and the Kurdish. And then there is this area of those popular mobilization forces, which gets quite interesting. There's very few organizations that engage there, um, but a clear sense that that's a lot where the problem is, and, and these are forces that are at least semi-legitimate in that sense. So that was the first point about really who are the armed actors that we're talking about in, in Iraq. The second point that I wanted to make is about what kind of protection issues are we talking about? And, and I think there's been a, a really very clear evolution and shift uh, over time as the, the phase of the conflict has, has changed as well, where during the campaign against ISIS, we were dealing with a lot of the classic protection issues that also a lot of the previous speakers from different other contexts referred to, you know, civilian deaths, destruction of property, uh, the treatment of prisoners of war and so on. So, so that was very preeminent during the fight against ISIS. But now afterwards, or you know, largely after, after that is done, we see civilians articulating different issues. Um, and they relate to things like, what is the role of armed actors in either forcing, facilitating, or hindering the return of IDPs? What, are, what is the economic role of armed actors? Where do they uh, you know, control business? Where do they extort money? And what is the cultural role um, of, of armed actors? We hear a lot of stories of civilians now being quite concerned about what flags uh, are visible, what place names are, are given, whether people are treated with, with dignity. So quite a different type of violation that is happening. And I believe the, the kind of obvious question that this raises for training or for those who engage with these armed actors is to say, well, do we need different approaches depending on the kind of violation? Is, is training always the, the right way? Um, and just to give an example here, if, for example, you have an armed group that is involved in a lot of economic, illicit economic activities, you know, perhaps training is not going to cut it because that is their core economic interest. The last point I wanted to make, um, where I believe Iraq is, is, is somewhat special, is the question of, well, other than training local forces, what other strategies are available? And really for us, what was remarkable when we looked at this was that there were two, two strategies um, that seemed to be quite special. The first was that because you have so many different armed actors, um, also within those popular mobilization forces, there are a lot, a lot of different uh, groups and, and forces that one of the predominant strategies really to change behavior was to exchange the force. So not to train the force and to improve its behavior, to, but to get rid of one force and bring in another. And from the civilians that we spoke to, that was really what made the big difference is if you got rid of one group and, and got another one, or you got rid of one commander and, and, and got another one who had different uh, behavior. And the other uh, strategy that was really very, very prominent um, is a community-based strategy. So as I said in the beginning, a, a lot of the militia groups or these hybrid popular mobilization forces that we see are very closely linked either to a tribe or to a leader or to a religious group. And therefore, these groups have quite a lot of influence um, over uh, those militias, perhaps more than the parliament or the commission that has been established to deal with these forces. And therefore, we see a lot of efforts directed at getting the communities and those leaders that are linked to the groups to, to really exert an influence and, and change the, the strategies that we see. These are the kind of three reflections I wanted to start us off with, and I'm also looking forward to the discussion and to questions. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Seeds. Um, just to uh, perhaps bridge kind of your analysis to uh, uh, Dr. Kadim's uh, uh, views, 
could you maybe reflect uh, briefly on the statement that you um, used kind of in the beginning of it? You were, and these are my words, my interpretations, uh, but you were saying uh, we should either focus on the most problematic actor uh, and try to train these or on uh, the actors that may be most aligned to the type of behavior we want to see and the interest that we are pursuing. So as, as, as outsiders to Iraq, where would you think uh, we should go uh, in the future? future, where do you think that balance should be between kind of actors who are uh, already kind of almost in the fold or the ones that who are mostly uh, or more problematic but uh, uh, less uh, capable of actually connecting with us or rather said us connecting with them uh, for various reasons not being possible. Could you give us a little bit of a reflection on how you view this issue? Thank you, Hans. It's a super tricky issue. I would say um, ideally one would focus on those forces that are meant to stay in the long term and that carry more legitimacy. Um, in the shorter term and being a bit more pragmatic, I think we also need to, to recognize and realize that certain of these militias are not going to disband. And it's interesting, some leaders have made moves to say they, they would potentially be, pre be prepared to disband the militias and it's certainly worth investing a lot uh, in, in that. But Perhaps we also at the same time need to be pragmatic and have perhaps not the full weight and, and the, the big bulk of the training, like the, the type of training that is going into the Peshmerga, for example. Um, I don't think we should invest a similar level of effort into training a particular uh, popular, a particular militia. But if we have identified one that really is, is quite problematic um, and looks like it's going to stay, I think it's still worthwhile trying to engage indirectly through those tribal leaders, religious leaders, et cetera, and perhaps through awareness raising, perhaps more that than classic military technical training. Great. Thank you very much for that reflection. Uh, now turning to uh, Dr. Hadim uh, Hassan. Thank you very much, uh, Hans. Uh, actually, uh, it's uh, great to listen to uh, uh, both speakers uh, um, and the IRCD and uh, just to let him know that I've been managing IRI before so uh, I have like uh, a full uh, clue about what's NDI doing and what's IRI doing uh, since 2003 uh, since uh, uh, the fail of the old regime and uh, thank you very much uh, Dr. Steve uh, for your uh, uh, comments and for your research but you know, sometimes we have a say, actually, don't try, uh, it's, it's a Lawrence of Arabia say, don't try to do too much in your own hands. It's better to make Arabs uh, do things terribly than you do it perfectly. It's their war to win and you are there to make them, uh, to help them to win that war. It's, it's better to understand the culture in, in, in the country. Uh, uh, since two or three, and actually, it's it's not just since two or three. The the similarity between Afghanistan and Iraq, it's they both been fighting for ages. We are fighting since the 80s till now. We don't know whom we are fighting. Uh, it's 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 something that can be similar to what's happening in Afghanistan. It's the same uh, non-stable country because of these wars, but. To talk about after regime and forget everything before the regime, that's kind of unfair to, to compare the situation of Iraqis and their culture wide. Talking about election and the, the current election is the best election, it's unfair too, uh, uh, if I may say. Because, uh, you know, to start as a democratic country from scratch, and to have election, that's a difficulty. And you might agree with me. So when you have election in 2005 and you have constitution uh, after a big referendum in Iraq, that's a big a democratic way to, 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 to do. And, you know, to pass all the civil wars and to pass all the fights against the oppositions, if I may say, from the old regime and from the militias, uh, uh, from different factions, Tunisians or, or Kurds, you know, to fight them during uh, 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 the civil war from 2005 till 
208, that's a big step for Iraqis. We didn't have that much of stabilization to say that this current election is the best model. And if we consider it, consider it the best model, why we, we have a woman win the election and she already passed two months ago? So it's kind of, there's some issues in, in, in the current election too. But I agree with you. Uh, to have 83 uh, uh, district, uh, to make the voters choose their own people, choose the names, and instead of choosing the party, I agree with you. This is the window for, for the new Iraq. But of course, that means we will start again from scratch. And I think Iraqis, they don't want to start from that uh, uh, particular uh, step. And the, the, the thing that make me uh, actually uh, think more when I being here in both of you, uh, you are not mentioning the regional interfering in our country. We are talking just about Iraqis themselves, but there is a lot of hands from our neighbor and, and others who are supporting some uh, political party, supporting functions, militias, if I may say, uh, uh, to create instability in my country. So when we are talking about training the forces, which kind of forces we are training? Who's training that forces? From where the money? Uh, it's, it's all questions. And uh, I, I think Mike will, will, uh, will have his comments when we've been receiving millions from, from United States to go on the corruption packets, not to go on training and having good forces to uh, be kind of uh, uh, bringing peace for, for Iraqis. And it's, it's raised to my mind uh, 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 mentioning training the Peshmerga. Does the Peshmerga report to the federal uh, uh, government? If we are not training the PMF, and they are part of the federal government currently, does the Peshmerga report to, to the uh, federal government? No. If it's worth to train the, the Peshmerga and they are good behaving, why don't we train the PMF? And according to uh, the last meetings with the NATO mission, uh, the Iraqi government requested, uh, and instead of just focusing on the Ministry of Defense, we've been requesting to diverse their trainings to include everybody, the Ministry of Interior, and was kind of concerns before in 2006, 2007, to train the Ministry of Interior because uh, the coalition consider uh, the Ministry of Interior part of Iranian agenda. But now we consider another functions of Iraqi government part of another Iranian agenda as a PMF. But don't forget, in 2014, in 2014, it was a war of existence. We faced the most evil, uh, if I call it a creature, called uh, Daesh or ISIS. And because of one fatwa, we create the PMF who has the opposite ideology of ISIS. And because of them, we liberated, as, as, as you mentioned, but uh, in, in my opinion, we should say we, we've been taken because I don't consider ISIS as state. We've been taking uh, back, again, our lands from, from uh, 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 ISIS, Daesh, because of all the forces of Iraqis fell down because they don't have the confidence of their state. But uh, PMF, they have that confidence. They felt that it's the end and they win the war. And because of that winning, the others follow that, that uh, 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 forces, the military, the Ministry of Frontier, and even the tribal, we mentioned the tribal many times in, in our uh, speeches. And don't forget, in 2007, the tribal, they've been defeating Qaeda by creating a project called Awakening has been supported from the coalition. And now the tribal became a malicious. It's a different definition between the Western and the, the Eastern. It's bad to go and live in Iraq and see what's going on. And I really admired uh, 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 that you show the Turegs, the Kurdish Turegs behind you, which is 
shows that you are living in Iraq and you are listening to Iraqis in their language, in their accent, and how much they are desperate for peace. Yes, we are not protected because there's too many actors. We don't know who's in charge of forcing law in, in our country. Because of that chaos of interfering, the coalition should start now, send messages of, I may say, United States, they should send messages to our neighbor. Don't interfere on Iraqis' uh, 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 problems. Don't be part of the problem. Be part of the solution. The recent movements from the Arabs uh, to Iraq, towards Ar Iraq, the meetings, the visits that we had, it's supposed to be happens in two or three. Nobody opened any embassy in Iraq before. The only ones, the Iranian who opened the embassy first. The only ones who helped Iraqis who opened their stores, but not for free, is the Iranians. So that's why you can see that Iraqis, they are not saying bad things about Iranian, I mean Shia, because they help them. But the others, the Arabs, I mean, They've been part of the other side. They've been sending messages through TV channels that ISIS, they call them rebel. They call them uh, tribal rebel. So in my opinion, we should unify the message that Iraqis have, that we should unify the forces under a joint uh, uh, commander, and that's happening, actually. Yes, there's some violations, but I think they will behave if we will do the right training, if we will do the culture advising uh, for the, uh, uh, the donors or the outside assistance support. In my opinion, this is the best solution and the strategy that Dr. Steve uh, 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 mentioned, the three phases of it, I do agree with them, but it's need to be kind of details uh, uh, to Iraqis, and you can see uh, uh, many res results of this strategy. And I recommend, I recommend that we have a big think tank called Al Nahrain Center. It's part government, part uh, uh, civil society, to engage with your research, so you can feed up your research and. Iraqis can get help from that because it's very close to the government. The government report that to that center. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, there's some clear tasks for the international community that you are uh, laying out. Before we get into these, can I first uh, hand over the, the word to uh, Mike Jason uh, uh, to kind of relate his experience and his views on, on this matter? Thank you. Thank you, Hans. And, and, uh, First off, uh, salam alaikum, shlonik, ismi, rad, jason, jaish, amriki, or at least that's what I remember, right? <laughs> Just to say that, uh, look, Iraq is really special to me, uh, very important. Uh, spent a lot of time there as did my two younger, three younger brothers uh, and many of my friends and, and lost several, uh, both on the Iraqi side and the American side. So it's, it's, it's extremely personal. Um, you know, it, it, I'm kind of reminded of a, of a comment that an Iraqi colonel made to me in 2006 during very, very bad years when he said, you know, giving democracy to Iraqis is like giving a gun to a child. And he was warning me about Pollyannish sort of optimism about the hard work that was ahead uh, to really help uh, the Iraqi people uh, achieve what the West had so innocently thought could be happen very quickly. So. I served there as a commander, as an advisor, and also in Afghanistan. So my comments come very from, from being on the ground and, and what I observed and what I observed of, of the US military commitment and, and the actions that we did and many of the mistakes that we did. I wanna leave you with sort of three, first three big points. I think Iraq and Afghanistan, we heard it, but I, we must restate the obvious. They're incredibly different places, whether it's the neighbors, as we just heard, the infrastructure, the terrain, the history, the culture, uh, and in the entire approach uh, that either the West, the allies, and the neighbors took uh, in both of those conflicts over the last 20 years. So we must be very weary of capturing things that can translate and looking at and pulling those threads all the way through with great nuance, precision, detail, and understanding of context. Second, technology is deceptive. 
we have all since probably 1991 or Hollywood have lulled ourselves into thinking that the the chain of events uh, from the from identifying an enemy target to pulling the trigger to that final explosion is going to be clean, precise, and wonderfully amazing with technology and precision. It is not. It may seem more accurate, but it, at the end of the day, the entire process is a human process full of errors and potential technolo technological failures. Uh, in a previous discussion, we heard about the Moab, the mother of all bombs and daisy cutters and JDAMs. But all of these things depend on a technology to work and a human being to see something, decide something, and ultimately pull the trigger and be held maybe accountable for it, maybe not. But we should not deceive ourselves because last, the last key point, despite our best intentions, and I'm here to tell you, the United States military, at least while I was there and they still are, despite what you might read and the problems and the mistakes we made as a culture, as a society, from the day I was at the military academy, we are absolutely obsessed with trying to prevent civilian casualties as much as possible. But as John said in a previous panel, it's not is going to be zero, but great care is taken to avoid them. And that's with technology and with, tech and with training and everything possible. But it is unavoidable in many ways because despite these intentions, war, conflict, will unleash violence and forces that we absolutely cannot control and do not necessarily know what is going to come out on the other side. And we should be cognizant of that as policymakers, as an international community, and as national security professionals. So just very quickly now, with that, I want to just, just break down so we understand what we're talking about. And I can, again, a little bit of analysis from my perspective of where things have gone off the rails. And I'll use the three levels of war, strategic, operational, and tactical. At the strategic level, I think, and I wrote about this, if the Atlantic piece you saw in, in the library, you know, the United States, the international community, we often really in Afghanistan lack, and I think to a great degree in Iraq, lacked a national or international strategy. By strategy, I mean ends, ways, means. What is a good end state? What does it look like and is it achievable? And do we have the right resources aligned to execute it? You know, in Afghanistan, we went in, it was for the Americans, it was 9-11, revenge, get rid of Al Qaeda. And then immediately within a year or two, we we're distracted by another operation in Iraq. Did we have the forces there that were necessary? The international community came, NATO came along, but what, what, where were we headed with this? Did we, did we set conditions with the neighbors, Pakistan, Iran, and everybody else that's involved, uh, as we just heard? And in today's conflicts, we must be cognizant of the strategy because all of we're seeing from all the way down in, in Ethiopia now and in Syria, most of these, we have sectarian ethnic issues, rev internal revolts. This isn't World War II anymore. This isn't World War I. These aren't nation state arms. Uh, these are very interesting, divided conflicts uh, that, that have long standing divisions and conflicts, as we just heard again recently. And in all of this, it comes down to at the strategic level, all of this is, is necessary because whatever government we, we as an international community are helping, is there the political legitimacy and ultimately the civil control of their military law enforcement or security forces? And again, we heard, is that militia? Is that federal police? Is that the cops? Is that special forces? There are so many different types. And is there a legitimate government in control? And did we help to ensure that? And that takes you right back to that corruption uh, and that institutional power and respect of the people for a government that has the monopoly of state violence. And how are we as allies, as partners, as trainers, enabling that legitimacy or undermining it potentially? And in operational, again, we're looking at militias and, and police and military and special forces. How are we organized to support them? The United States does not have a carabinieri force or a gendarme, or we don't do that. The United States does not have the capability of training a national police force because we don't have one. Other countries do, but were we organized that way? So me, Mike, an, a tank colonel at the time, I'm helping train Iraqi police forces and Afghan local police forces. I've never been a police officer a day in my life, but yet we were not 
organized to do so. And so we had this ham fisted, as we would say, approach year by year as we tried to piece it together, uh, but with really lacking the operational construct to train and advise. And again, uh, the placement of forces matters. Are there trainers and advisors at the very tactical level? And then ultimately, is there accountability? So operationally, uh, how, how do we establish this kind of training? And that leads you to tactical and that all the way to who clears fires. You know, when we launch to have this air support for these local forces, where is that decision chain made? Where is the chain of command? Who has the authority? I remember back in 2006 in Iraq, there was you, you had an Iraqi partner unit, but is the U.S. in charge? There's almost in these conflicts like there's almost three separate wars going on at the exact same time. There's the advisors with their local forces. Uh, there's the conventional foreign forces like the U.S. Army and other NATO allies. And then there's a special forces f a fight that's ongoing uh, that is a, a microcosm of all three that has partners. And, and it, there's, there's, you know, I worked with German special forces and Americans, and they had their own tribal system. We call them the tribes, the different kinds of special forces. All these often didn't talk to each other. And so as we look at, for example, uh, the, the Kunduz accident, accident, the Kunduz tragedy, uh, we looked at it was an allied airplane bombing a hospital uh, because it was targeted by an Afghan commando. Uh, and there wasn't an advisor on the ground to validate the rules of engagement or whether the target should have been bombed or not. I think we're going to discover the same in Syria with the latest event that the United States government is investigating. It really comes down to, goes back to the very first comment. Uh, that I made, that we expect technology to be flawless, to be amazing. But at the end of the day, in, in these ethnic interscene conflicts, who is calling the airplane that multi-million dollar missile on the wedding or the, or the party, and who is making that ultimate decision? And it's not risk-free. And that comes back to how we organize and the tactics that we employ. And so civilian casualties continue to be a strategic issue. In the past, we might have called it collateral damage, and it was something we could wish away or investigate. Uh, but as, as I learned as a commander, when we encountered civilian casualties, the enemy, the Taliban, is going to exploit them. ISIS is going to exploit them. It's going to be on TikTok or YouTube or, or Twitter within minutes of it happening. And so we must be ready for it. We must acknowledge who did it, why, and what happened, even if it's an accident, and be transparent because the enemy surely will use it for their propaganda. And that's the enemy, whether it's Daesh or ISIS or, or ISIS-K or whoever it might be. But civilians are and will be, continue to be a strategic issue. And so, uh, and I close, and uh, thank you for introducing me as working with, with this nonprofit now, uh, because many veterans in the US and around, even in, in Britain and in Germany, many of us have gathered together because our responsibility to civilians does not end with the avoidance of, of casualties in a conflict, but post-conflict, many of us continue to feel responsible for their safety uh, and ongoing evacuations. Uh, thank you, and I, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for that one. Um, before we go to questions uh, uh, of the audience, I would like to ask you one thing, Mike. Uh, you mentioned legitimacy of government as kind of a, a, a key notion. Um, however, if we compare legitimacy in Iraq, what is considered to be legitimate in Iraq from the Iraqi citizens of their government, that might be very different than is what is considered to be legitimate from the U.S. side. So we have two governments, two sets of, of, of diverse constituents, obviously, uh, and uh, legitimacy is, is of key importance. Now, if we compare the two... Uh, I imagine, from the U.S. perspective, different things are prioritized for Iraq than Iraqis would prioritize for themselves. So we have a bit of a, a, an issue there. Could you reflect on how you see legitimacy both in uh, the country sending troops and legitimacy in the country that we aim to assist, uh, to stabilize? How do these two weigh up against each other? Yeah, I, I think that's I mean, it's a fundamental question, right? Uh, the... The, the, the mistakes, as I think we heard in the earlier panel, you know, the Taliban wanted to surrender, for example, in Afghanistan, and our Secretary of Defense said absolutely not. And so they were pushed to the side, but they never really went away. Mm. Uh, and so to the Afghan people, there was there was for 20 years a, a contest of legitimacy between an, the imposed government, if, if you will, 
by the by us by the international community as some people thought it was imposed uh, and and a, and a resurgent Taliban and in Iraq uh, there's there's been conflicting again conflicting forces uh, I think the clearest example of that is uh, when uh, President Obama really in 2011 looked at withdrawing the troops uh, we we had a situation where uh, the, the leader of Iraq uh, could not legitimately ask for the occupier, the foreign forces to stay in country. And President Obama politically, for his legitimacy, uh, could not prolong the war. And so both play chicken. Who's gonna, we, we know we needed to stay, uh, but neither was willing to ask the other because of their own constituency legitimacy question. And so what happened? We left immediately and abruptly. Uh, and within two years, ISIS comes back. Uh, I, I strongly contend there has to be a stronger dialogue, and, and we have hopefully learned that the domestic legitimacy of government is absolutely critical. And going back to Afghanistan, I hope it informs what we do in the days ahead, in the months ahead, with having to potentially deal with the Taliban that is de facto the government of Afghanistan. Uh, and if we want to help the Afghan people, uh, we are going to have to put some pride away and negotiate and deal with them as a, a, a legitimate power source of that country. Great. Thank you very much for uh, elaborating on that. Um, what I would like to turn uh, to a few questions now from the uh, audience. Um, if we are uh, looking at the uh, uh, militias in, in Iraq in this case, is there a broader political plan or at least an aspiration to disarm and integrate these hybrid militias? And um, I would first like to, to turn to Hassan kind of to get an, a bit of a view kind of from Iraq, from Baghdad kind of, is there, is there indeed this, this notion of, of bringing them all together? Okay. Uh, uh, to talk about militias, first of all, let's know Who's the militias? Mm -hmm. It's good that they mention political parties. Since they create the new Iraq after 203, each party creates their own wing, uh, uh, military wing, which is uh, transferred later to uh, 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 units. Uh, some of them, they join the policing. Some of them, they join the Ministry of Defense. And that's why they've been kind of some concerns of dealing with some ministries uh, at the start of the new governments. Uh, after uh, 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 the SOFA deal, 2011, when uh, uh, the, uh, the American forces left, in a way, the Iraq, uh, we saw the grow up of some militias uh, uh, in Iraq. And uh, in two years, we saw ISIS in our country. Those militias, some of them, they helped to liberate this, uh, these areas. Some of them, they've been kind of uh, uh, used as a protection units to protect their, uh, the, the areas, like, like uh, a militia called Sa'irun, but they don't call them uh, uh, militias and they used to be against the American forces as a Mahdi militia at that time but currently now they are the winners of the current election mm. and they still having forces on the ground but we are not targeting we are not putting our fingers on those fighters we are targeting the losers who is con uh, considered as uh, currently as uh, uh, the coordination uh, committee, which is, includes most of the Shia factions who lost the current election, and they have uh, uh, units, fight, uh, fighter units. Some of them, they are part of uh, the PMF. The rest, who's, I agree with you, we should work together with the PMF because they are the bridge between the legitimate forces and non-legitimate militias called uh, from your side. So, for instance, Hezbollah, one of the uh, uh, militias in Iraq, and Nujaba, they are not part of the uh, PMF. So they are not part of the reporting uh, for, for the PM, for instance. But we still having another army in the North region, if we consider it part of the federal government, they are not reporting to the uh, uh, 
the prime minister. So it's kind of dilemma here. When you talk to the Shia forces, why you are not disarm your forces, they will say, why you are not reporting that to the North region and they are not giving their weapons. And there is a decision from uh, the U.S. forces or the U.S. government to support the North region individually and to support the Sunnis. So he consider the Sunni as a country now and he consider uh, the, the Kurds as a country. It's one state, but you are dealing with the three parts of that state. So one of the uh, uh, gaps here, you are not dealing directly with the, the center to approach uh, the arms. So uh, this, is, this is the dilemma. Does the Americans want stability or they want to separate the country to three divisions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one of the questions that we got from the audience also deals with uh, the issue of, of top-down and bottom-up assistance. And whereas uh, uh, training uh, uh, certain troops is often done rather top-down, the question would also be if there's assistance possible bottom-up. And I would like to uh, perhaps first ask Steve and, and Julia to reflect on this also kind of with their view on, on the political dynamics in Iraq. Um, is there any meaningful contribution that either the international community or others can do to actually uh, uh, help bottom up changes and, and specifically with an eye on, on legitimacy, as, as we have talked about before? Uh, Steve, may I hand over to you for this? Yeah, I think, Hans, when we talk about bottom up, uh, there's certainly a role. Now, I'm not going to talk about uh, the militias and training of the militias, but when it comes to democracy, and I, I think uh, Dr. Hassan made, made a point earlier about the imposition of, of the government, uh, a democracy, if you will, after, after 2003 and how difficult that is uh, to, to expect uh, the people of Iraq just to embrace the system of democracy and, and run with it. Um, and even though we're, we're now you know, a couple decades in, we're still a long, long way from uh, people embracing uh, democracy and understanding democracy and, and really celebrating the freedoms um, that one might consider when we talk about democracy. And, and it's for the Iraqi people to decide, quite frankly. But interestingly, um, we, we were talking to the Ministry of Youth and Sport, we've been talking to the Ministry of Education about you know, how we teach from the bottom up uh, about democracy, because what happened here is that we imposed a democracy from the top down. And, and it wasn't brought from the bottom up. Um, you know, what we had here was uh, a system that was a, an authoritarian system, uh, despite the fact that we had a lot of tribal leaders uh, who were expressing their own interests uh, uh, throughout, throughout Iraq. But there hasn't been this bottom up approach in terms of teaching democracy uh, in the schools. It's not even taught in the curriculum in, in uh, many of the primary and secondary schools. And so it's really an unrealistic expectation to expect people to just embrace democracy. We've been working with these protesters uh, from the Tijrini movements who, who want to change government, who want to do something about government and who talk a lot uh, about democracy. But when you sit down with them, they don't know what that change looks like because they don't understand the functioning of the government. And, and I think that's what, uh, you know, the people of Iraq are really calling for. They're, they're saying, how can we get support to actually just deliver services? Um, so for instance, in, in this most recent election, uh, I thought it was very, very interesting to see what new generation did up here in Kurdistan. And like I said, they had, they won nine seats. They came from out of nowhere and, and won nine seats by far the most they've ever gotten. And in large part, it was due to the fact that in Sulaymaniyah, they, they delivered services where government wasn't providing water, where government wasn't paving roads. Um, they went in and did it. And so when we talk about bottom-up assistance, I really think we need to talk about basic delivery of services, basic understanding of democratic principles. Um, but unfortunately, what we end up talking about is the militias and, and the militias role when it comes to governance uh, in Iraq. And as was pointed out, there, 
there's a vast array uh, of militias. Uh, there are the PMUs that are associated with the government. There are Iranian-backed Shia militias. There are Sunni militias. There are militias associated with the, both tribes and parties. Uh, and then there's the Peshmerga, as was, as was pointed out. Now, uh, the winner of the election, the Sadrist, Muqtad al-Sadr, has been talking about um, bringing all of the militias under the government. And he has talked about his own, uh, it was mentioned the Cyrone movement and, and the Sadrist army, if you will, uh, being brought in. And, and the question is, is, is that real? Is, is he willing to do that? Are the other, uh, are the other militias willing to also uh, engage in that type of uh, coordination and co coming under one government together? Because until we get to that point, you're not going to have a, a democratic system that really functions in Iraq, as long as these militias keep controlling different parts of the country. They performed quite poorly in the election, um, due in part because they're losing popular support, but also because they didn't adjust their political strategy to this new system with these districts. Um, and so they were probably, when it comes to just uh, the political landscape, um, they, they performed uh, quite poorly uh, when it comes to the elections. And they've, they've accused IHEC, they've accused others of, of electoral fraud, uh, a la Donald Trump in the United States, um, without really be bringing forward much proof uh, of that fraud. And so, so I think when we talk about bottom up, uh, we need to address the issue of militias in order to move forward when it comes to democracy. We need to educate people uh, when it comes to, you know, what the principles of democracy are and determine, uh, the Iraqis need to determine uh, whether or not those principles best apply to what they're trying to achieve in governance. And then we have to focus on delivery of services uh, because right now far too much money is going into the pockets of politicians and government officials and far too little of it is reaching uh, the streets and the neighborhoods of the people uh, where it should be going. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Uh, Julia, may we uh, hand it over to you from your, for your reflection on what this may mean, actually, this bottom-up uh, accountability or bottom-up assistance, even. Certainly. Thank you. And I think Steve, in the beginning of his remark, put his finger right on the issue in the sense that there is a bit of an inherent contradiction of how much from the outside can you build bottom-up governance structures. And I think it's exactly when it comes to issues of the protection of civilians and the efforts that have been made in, in Iraq, you see this inherent contradiction play out beautifully, beautifully in the sense that it's very clear, not, not that it's great. So we have spoken to so many organizations who will have told us, yes, and we've been involved in creating this community committee for peace, for reconciliation, for you name it. It, it, it comes in a hundred different shades. Um, and each of them was meant to be like an, an assistance to those bottom-up structures, enabling them capacity building, structuring them so that they can engage in governance processes and they can engage with armed actors. And as a result, um, you have so many fragmented efforts um, that I would almost say that the, the entire approach is, is discredited. Like people say, you know, we've sat on, uh, I don't know, 10 of these committees. Um, each one is a little bit different and each follows the logic of the organization that is supporting it. So while in theory, it sounds like a great idea and like the right approach. In practice, there is this inherent contradiction of how can you come in from the outside and really support a bottom-up structure, which is very, very hard to, to deal with. And if I may, I did want to come back as well to the first question, um, which was linked to, to Ghassan's uh, challenge, um, saying, you know, if the international community at the moment is actually training the Peshmerga, the Kurdish first forces, which are not uh, under the federal control, why would they not uh, be supporting capacity building, training the popular mobilization forces, the PMF and PMU, which at least most of them, technically speaking, are under the PMF commission? And 
Um, I think what, what you see, at least at the moment, is that even, even for those groups that technically are under the commission and under, under the, the umbrella of the federal government, de facto, they are very independent power bases. And we've had a lot of individual examples where certain orders came from the top, from the federal level, and they were just blatantly ignored, just mm. demonstrating um, how much autonomy these groups still have. And so I would say that if indeed this move to bringing these forces under control, under a more centralized control, is real, then it might make sense to start training them. But I don't think we're there yet by, by, by any stretch of the imagination. Thank you very much. Hassan, can I ask you for a reflection on this? Yes, uh, actually, the question, who decide uh, uh, whom to train here? <clears throat> I mean, you know, in which standards we decide to train PMF or Peshmerga, because Peshmerga is close to the Western world and PMF close to Iranian world. It seems that, you know, we are under the negotiation between United States and Iran, and Iran is using the militias for their own sake uh, to win the negotiation of the nuclear. So it seems that there's a lot of uh, issues in our uh, uh, country as a, a stable country, but the main the main word, if I may say, that our neighbor or the outsiders, if I may say, I mean the foreign countries, they should think if we will not be a stable country. I don't think we will see neighbor stable countries. Uh, uh, there's no water in Iraq because of our two neighbors' countries, Iran and Turkey. They are building dams and they are cutting the water from Iraq. Why there is no movements from the NATO and Turkey is part of the NATO? Uh, and this is part of the protection, if I may say, because war is not just about having weapons. The, the next uh, war generation will be water, water war. So there's a war against Iraq. Why you are not defending Iraq? If, if you, we pretend that there's a coalition to protect Iraqis as a government or as people, if I may say. But to back to the training should we train from the top or from the bottom? In my opinion, we should do the same. I mean, we should do the, the top and the bottom because if you will not train the top, the, the lower people or the lower staffers, they will not understand what's happening uh, in the top on the senior level. And if you will do training just for the junior uh, uh, staffers, the upper ones will not allow the junior to use their authority. So it's better to collect them together to have training for both sides. If, I, if I'm in charge, to have training for both sides and create that bridge between both sides. So this is what we've been missing. We didn't create bridge between the upper and the lower. That's why I'm sorry I'm saying to my people, they are lower people, but I'm trying to compare between the government and the people. Because uh, Iraqis, they are not lower people. We create the letters for the word. In my opinion, we should give lessons to our government to treat our people differently, to provide service, as Steve said, to provide uh, uh, security to our people. And instead of having all these tanks, all these deals without any benefits, and instead of having all the donation going to somewhere else, I mean, there is a lot of offers has been given from uh, the community, international community, to Iraqis, but it goes in different ways. When we mentioned the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the comment that the doctor mentioned about she asked questions to many organizations and, uh, and they are follow the donation because we gave them that lesson. We didn't have civil society unless we have the failure of the old regime. So we have a new organization and we've been training them to follow the donor and instead of doing their own uh, job properly. This is my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, can I jump in, if possible? Yes, please do. Oh, I, wonderful, wonderful to hear all the comments. And I think 
I, I reflect back on the last 20 years and the, the common theme between Iraq and Afghanistan uh, it is a common thread when we deal with these militias and armed groups, right? And it's ultimately that the West, whether it's the Americans or NATO or the international community, we consistently kept picking winners and losers as groups. And so in Afghanistan, we told the Taliban, you know, thanks to Rumsfeld, you're out. We want nothing to do with you. Uh, and, and then we empowered the Tajik militias or the Hazaras into the commando forces. In Iraq, we see the same. We debathify, kick everybody out of the military, and people lost jobs. We do it again with the sons of Iraq later on. Al-Maliki doesn't want to pay them anymore. And so they fall out of favor. And, and we consistently do this. And then we have uh, the, the Kurdish militias become a division and the Shia become federal police. We sort of, again, pick and choose here and there. But here's the theme. What's missing, and as a, as a military former military professional, what I can tell you dealing with young men and women, is there's something intoxicating about the pride, sense of purpose, and camaraderie of being in a fighting force. And if we as an international community don't start thinking about the individual human experience of disarming, we are never going to tackle this. We've been at this. I've been personally at this for 20 years. And it comes down to young men who have a sense of purpose, who need to go home or need to find another job in an economically devastated post-war environment. And we fail to address that. You know, I, I look back, if you look at the January 6th attack on our U.S. Capitol, many were veterans because there's something about having a sense of purpose and reaching back to violence and being part of that team of other young men and that, that is, again, intoxicating. Uh, and so, uh, we that's where the solution is, is, is there has to be from top, from bottom, from an international community pressure. How do we disarm and return young men who've had this sense of purpose back to society? And, and there has to be there are probably going to be a transition. We're going to legitimize some of these forces, uh, but we have to stop picking winners and losers uh, based on what's convenient, uh, what looks just like us and what sounds like us. And then moving on to the next uh, next object. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid we only have five minutes left. And kind of one issue that I would like to uh, pose to all of you is that we've been talking about different perspectives, about bottom up, about top down, about uh, tech being deceptive. Uh, if you're an outsider and want to understand uh, what the situation is. And obviously, uh, in uh, whether we look inside Iraq, in the region or internationally, there are a huge variety of, of perspectives. What needs to happen? And what are the priorities? Now, understanding the situation uh, is hugely important, whether we look at it from it bottom up or top down, understanding a situation also longer term so that you can hopefully uh, start predicting what your own uh, 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 actions will uh, cause uh, or how they will contribute to, to stability is incredibly important. So to round off this conversation, I would like to uh, pose this que question to each and every one of you. What is the key lesson that you, from your perspective, are taking away to better understand the situation so that efforts in the future will also contribute to stability rather than undermine uh, stability and 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 uh, cause insecurity. Um, Mike, can I start with you on that one? I come back to having, again, a national strategy and a national community strategy and will uh, and an under deeper understanding of of what is going to happen and what resources have to be applied against it, and and that requires, as we talked about earlier. Uh, a legitimacy, a political legitimacy back home to sustain the effort uh, and working within an understanding of a context of a legitimacy and lack of corruption and transparent and full transparency of, of the government that we are trying to help shape uh, and, and, and ultimately prevail as a democracy. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Steve, may I hand it over to you, please? Yeah, I think I would go back to what I said at the beginning and that the, the people are tired and and too often they see international resources going to the elite. They see the elite getting richer. Uh, they see the military picking up more arms. Um, yet services, you know, they, they still don't have electricity. My electricity went out during this meeting. Um, and, and, and I think uh, that's where we need to start. We, we need to 
listen to and address the needs of the people as they're being articulated by the people uh, and empowering women, empowering IDPs, empowering the youth um, and, and quit listening necessarily to the political elite who are the recipients uh, of this uh, external funding that often doesn't get uh, shifted down to, to meet the priorities of the people. Thank you. Uh, before we uh, turn to Hassan for the, the last few words on this one, Julia, may I ask you to uh, for your final contribution? Yes, thank you. I agree with what Steve and Mike uh, have said and therefore turn to another uh, aspect, which is about the silos that the internationals work in. And I find this was quite striking, even just in this area of working on the protection of civilians in, in Iraq, where, for example, you have that large Western military apparatus that is so involved and spends so many resources on training different military groups uh, in the country. And then you have international civil society that comes in with a similar purpose, much more focused on protection. And there does not seem to be much exchange between the two, uh, let alone an, an, an effort, for example, from the civil society to use the, the Western military effort as, as a lever uh, to, to really bring about the change that could be brought about. And, and that seems to be a very kind of small and easy uh, change to make that could uh, enhance the, the effectiveness of the efforts quite, quite a lot. Excellent. Thank you very much. Hassan? Uh, I, will, I will start with a say, a wisdom say, raise your words, not your voice. Because it's uh, the rain that grows the flower, not the thunder. In my opinion, we should be more practical than theory uh, players. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've been uh, listening to a lot of models and we are not practicing, uh, practicing our own model, the Iraqi model. It's bad to Iraqis to listen to their superior, not to listen to the foreign superiors. We can take their examples, we can take their uh, uh, experience, but take the positive things to unify your country. And instead of having several countries, might be more than three, might be 30 or 83 country soon, if we will continue playing that game. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hassan. Uh, with that, I certainly am not going to attempt to wrap up by some brilliant conclusion of what you have all been contributing in the last hour and 15 minutes. And I surely would hope that, um, or had hoped that we had longer time, as this is a very rich conversation. Uh, it's an excellent exchange. And uh, I would like to, again, thank all of you for your valuable time uh, and valuable uh, uh, insights that you have shared with us uh, today. So um, thank you very much uh, for joining us here online, for joining us here in, in person. Um, what I would like uh, the audience or the participants uh, to do is thank them also very much for the questions that they have sent in. I would also like to ask them to uh, join an evaluation that will come into uh, uh, your image uh, quickly to just wrap up the day and what you thought of this um, session. Um, I would, of course, like to invite you to participate uh, tomorrow. Uh, please, for all details of tomorrow's program, uh, please visit the section on our uh, uh, web platform. Uh, and please let us know if you have any suggestions, any questions concerning uh, today's program uh, or tomorrow's sessions. With that, I would like to thank you all again. Uh, thank you uh, to our contributors. Uh, and thank you for all the active participations on the platform. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.